Hello everybody, this is Mr. Rob and welcome back to episode number 39 of the Detroit Lions franchise here on Madden NFL 21. Happy Saturday, hope everybody is enjoying their Saturday morning so far. I'll give you a little special episode as we have reached the halfway point in the season. So we're going to do a little bit of a mid-season recap here. If you're excited for this, make sure you leave a like and subscribe down below, especially if you want more franchise content. 2021 has been a good year on the channel so far, let's make it a good one for the rest of the way. So we'll start off by looking at the standings. Obviously, our Lions sit at two and six, not the best as we've lost four straight games and are at the bottom of the NFC North. But in terms of the whole league, there is three seven one teams at the top, the Buffalo Bills, the Green Bay Packers, and the 49ers who lost their first game and won seven in a row. And the worst team in the league is the Miami Dolphins sitting at one seven. That's not a good start, it looks like, to Tua in his time in Miami. Uh, we'll go by the divisions now, starting off with the AFC North. Looks like the Pittsburgh Steelers are on top. Remember, Jameis Winston is the new starter in Pittsburgh, so doing pretty well out there, followed by the Bengals and the Browns. Browns are your AFC defending champs. In the South, it's the Jacksonville Jaguars and Justin Fields out to a 5-4 record, followed closely by the Titans and the Texans. In the East, the Bills 7-1, Patriots are two games behind at 5-3. And, and then out in the West, the Chiefs sit at 6-2. Raiders two games behind at 4-4. Four four. In our division, the NFC North, the Packers are your leaders sitting at 7-1, Vikings second with 4-4. Four and four. In the South, it is the Atlanta Falcons who are up 5-4, a half game over the Panthers and the defending champ, the New Orleans Saints. They sit at 3-5. and five. In the East, it is the football team and the Cowboys both sitting at 6-3, and three, followed by the Eagles and Giants both at 4-4. Four and four. And then in the West, the 49ers, who are 7-1, looking to get back to the Super Bowl. And the rest of the squads are 4-4. Four four. That's a look at the standings. It's the halfway point, so we're also going to take a look at the stats, see where our team shapes up around the league as well as the players. Offensively, we are 30th, so almost at the bottom. And then defensively, we sit at 27th. It's kind of what you expect with a 2-6 team. The stats aren't going to look that great. 25th, though, in points scored. And points allow we are 26. So we give up a lot of yards, and, um, but at least our point differential isn't as bad. Taking a look at player stats now, starting off with Matthew Stafford at 2,000 yards, halfway through, 11 touchdowns, 10 picks. He's had a rough past couple of games um, in the interception category, and there's been a lot of rumors going around about Stafford's future on the team. So it'll be interesting to see what happens the rest of the way. See if he is indeed still an elite quarterback or is his time coming to an end he's thrown a total of six interceptions in the past three matchups not very good as his rating hasn't got any higher than an 86 as well another area we've struggled at is the rushing department uh, deandre swift does lead us with 294 yards on 66 attempts he we do basically do a 50 50 split between him and carry on and our offensive line's been kind of banged up recently, so the running game hasn't been going very well. As you can see this season so far, he hasn't had a single 100 yard, oh no, he did have 100 yards against the Giants, but um, had his best game this past week, but look, 12 yards, nine yards, 26 yards. It's been a rough year in the rushing department for Slitz as he's also yet to find the end zone. Carry on Johnson, he hasn't fared really any better. 70 carries, 260 yards, two touchdowns, and, Kerryon Johnson is a free agent this year. Right now, he's asking for a five-year contract. Now, with the way he's played this season, I don't know if he's really worthy of a five-year deal. Um, he's also had a hard time getting going. At least he's found the end zone a couple of times. But uh, I have a very skeptical about giving him a long-term deal. Other players, Stafford, he's got two touchdowns on the ground. Ty Johnson has a touchdown on two carries. And then we've also seen a carry for Tyler Vaughn's on a jet sweep that went backwards. In the receiving game, it's led by Kenny Galladay, who signed a four-year extension last offseason. He's on pace for over 1,200 yards and eight touchdowns. So glad to have Kenny Galladay on the team. He has bailed us out plenty of times this year as we take a look at his season totals. I mean, he's eclipsed 100 only twice, 130 and 106, but he's always been above basically that 70 yard minus the one Seahawk game. So he's obviously a reliable number one. Behind him though, it kind of falls off dramatically. Second in the rush receiving category is DeAndre Swift. He's got three receiving touchdowns and 334 yards. He's also the reception leader. 
So we'll take a look at his receiving stats now. He's getting a lot involved in the passing game, and I think that's a good, but it's also a bad thing. Uh, if he's getting way, I think he's getting too many receptions, which means we're having to dump the ball off too many times. Not many receivers are getting open downfield. And it's kind of hurting us, I think, overall. So while I think Swift's done good with his touches in the receiving game, I like for him to maybe get a little less. But that takes us to TJ Hawkinson, who has 22 for 273 and a touchdown. I like to see him get a little bit more involved. He's kind of disappeared recently, as I think we throw to Galladay a lot. We throw out of the slot a lot recently. And it's resulted in a lot of shallow games for Hawkinson. Two for 36 last time. He had no catches against Arizona. He did have a eight for 51 day against the Rams, but it's kind of been shallow since week four. Um, he's been too hit or miss, and I want Hawkinson to be the tight end of the future. He's just got to get a little bit more involved. Then it's our usual slot man, Danny Amendola, who has 23 grounds for 263 yards. He had 10 touchdowns a season ago. Has yet to find the end zone at the halfway point, and he's not going to find the end zone for another four weeks as he's still dealing with that upper arm fracture. He has signed on a one-year deal for the rest of the season. you got to wonder, is this his last hurrah? And if it is, I'd like to see him at least go out better as he's had a hard time in the slot and hasn't been nearly as productive this year as he was last year. Someone who has taken his place in the slot is Tyler Vaughns. We'll go back to Patterson in a minute, but Tyler Vaughns, the second round pick out of USC has really made the most of his snaps. Uh, his first real chance to succeed was last outing in the game against Green Bay as he took over for Amendola and he had eight catches for 117 yards. So Tyler Vaughn's somebody I'm looking forward to in the slot. Fortunately, it comes at the expense of Amendola's injury, but if Tyler Vaughn's can continue the production he had against Green Bay, I think he could be our slot man of the future at the very least. And lastly, in this receiving category, it's Cordero Patterson, who has 20 catches for 237 yards and two touchdowns. Patterson was signed to a three-year deal in the offseason. He had a career year catching for Chicago last year. As you can see, his total is over 1,200 yards and two touchdowns. He's yet to find that magic so far this season, and you got to wonder, is it a one-hit wonder? Did we overpay for Patterson? As he didn't have a single catch against Green Bay, he had six versus Minnesota, seven versus Los Angeles, but he was very cold to start the year. It took up till week three to get a catch. So hopefully it wasn't a one hit wonder for Cordell Patterson. Hopefully you can find that mojo back. Otherwise we'll be stuck with him for another two years. Also in the catching, Jesse James, he has five for 36 and a touchdown. He's a very good backup tight end. Uh, I like to run a little bit more two tight end sets uh, in the second half of the season as he's very serviceable, six, seven. He's gonna be a red zone target with that size. He's got good hands, so we'll have to get Jesse James on the field a little bit more. Johnson has five catches for 26. Jarrett Patterson, the undrafted rookie at Buffalo, is two for 26. And Seth Williams also has one for eight. I think we'll see a little bit more Seth Williams now when we go spread now that Danny Amendola is hurt. So expect to see a little bit more out of the third round pick from Auburn. He's got very good hands. His route running, not the best, but at least he could be a reliable target. Now we'll go to blocking where we have had a very banged up offensive line. Uh, we'll start with left tackle Taylor Decker, who's only played in five games. He's allowed two sacks and he's out with a fractured foot. Uh, I want him to be our left tackle of the future, but he's had a hard time staying on the field and he is signed through next year. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with Decker. He's been replaced by Jake Burton since he's been hurt, the undrafted man out of UCLA. And I mean, Burton's kind of been what you expect. He's not going to light it up in the left tackle spot. Uh, if he's going to face a, an elite pass rusher, um, it's going to not end well for Matthew Stafford. So can't wait to have Taylor Decker back. The left guard, it has been Joe Dahl, who hasn't been horrible in the past game, but rushing wise, it has been hard to run up the middle as Joe Dahl is not the best run blocker. And it's kind of showed in our running game. We've had a hard time moving the ball. And I think that's because players like Joe Dahl, he just hasn't done the best job at moving people out of the middle. Frank Ragnow is our center. He's done a good job at being an anchor. Um, I think he does a good job up the middle, but obviously he doesn't have the he hasn't had the best guard so far. So, um, but I think Frank Ragnow is a very solid center. At right guard, it usually is Kalechi Assembly, who in his first four games has played phenomenal, but he got hurt. After that, and he's missed the past about 
what is that now, four games, so he's missed the second quarter of the season. Uh, fortunately, Kelechi Osimile is back and healthy for our next game against Cleveland, so that'll be a welcome addition. As Jonah Jackson has not been good at all in his place. Uh, the second year man out of Ohio State uh, has been pretty bad, both in the run game as well as in the pass game. And, you know, I want him to be a serviceable backup, but, you know, I don't know if Jonah Jackson is got a spot on the future. At right tackle, it's been Vitae Halapuli Vitae Vitae. Uh, as I always try to say his name, uh, the offensive tackle that Detroit overpaid for a season ago before the new regime came in. He's been, you know, just average. Uh, you know, has paid for big money for the next couple of seasons, so it's going to be hard to move on from him, as you can see his contract. 8.4 next year, followed by 10.4 and 10.4. I mean, we're tied to this man for a while, and he's kind of just been mediocre at best. Move to the defensive side of the ball now. We'll start off with our tackle, tackle leader so far, and it's Jamie Collins. He has been by far the best player on this defense. 77 tackles, 5 sacks, and then he had that 3 interception game. Jamie Collins at 31 years old. He's had a very better 2021. I think we didn't fully utilize him to his potential last year. He kind of used him more as a pass rusher. And the fact that he got 8 sacks out of that was pretty impressive, but... Uh, Jamie Collins, in my opinion, is more known as a field general kind of move around linebacker. And it's showed out this year. He's got way more tackles. He's made on pace to do better sacks. And he's got three picks. So good for Jamie Collins. We'll move now to the front seven as starting off with, we'll start off with Trey Flowers. Where is Trey Flowers? He hasn't had a good year in terms of tackles for a loss. No, we'll average it by sacks. Sacks will probably be better for the defensive line. Yeah. So Trey Flowers sits with our team lead six and a half sacks. Um, Trey Flowers has really broken out in the past couple of years. He's kind of been the anchor of our defensive line. The sixth rank right in in the league. Does it all. He plays all three downs. Uh, had a good season as well last year with 16 sacks. Not on pace for 16, but six and a half is a pretty good uh, number at the halfway point. And he's tied up for big money for the next couple of years. So. Glad per Trey Flowers is getting paid like an elite player, and he's, you know, producing as an elite player. So good to see that for Trey Flowers. Next, we'll go to the rookie, the number 10 overall pick out of Florida State, Marvin Wilson, who at the end of last episode, if you missed it, we found out he does have star dev. So I was hoping for superstar considering he was the number 10 pick, but uh, we could deal with star dev. Uh, he is very strong, and he's a very good run stopper, and he's not half bad in the pass game as well. Six sacks so far for Marvin Wilson. Um, he has yet to record a tackle for a loss, so I think he could do a little better in the run game, but he's the one getting double teamed most of the time, and you know it's hard to fight through double teams, but I think Marvin Wilson's done a phenomenal job so far this year. Six sacks. Uh, he will anchor the defensive line for a while in the future. Um, Let's we'll swing over to the other side to Sean Hand. Um, the other young defensive lineman has three and a half sacks, also has no tackles for a loss. So our run defense hasn't been that great. And I hope Deshaun Hand, who specializes in the run stopping category, can do a little better in the second half of the season. Um, he's more of a run stopping specialist, so I expect more from that category and not three and a half sacks. He also had 10 sacks last year, so Hand a little bit better in the pass category, but we already have a good couple of pass rushers. I'd like for somebody to step up in the run game. And that's going to bring us to the last man on that starting front four listed. And it's Danny Shelton. Danny Shelton has not played good at all. As the 28-year-old from Washington is a run-stopping specialist. And he really hasn't done anything. He has five tackles. I think he has a one sack on the season. And no, he doesn't even have a sack. He has one tackle for a loss. And Danny Shelton's production has really declined in the past couple years. So you can see last year it wasn't even that good either. Um, in my opinion, he is the odd man out on this defensive line. Is him, Flowers, Wilson, Hand. They all kind of follow the same mold. Uh, we did run a 3-4 last year, so he could be that more nose. But now that we run a 4-3, I don't know if there's really a spot for Danny Shelton on this team. So expect him to be the odd man out. That's why he also doesn't get as many downs played as the other. How many downs? He's played 125, so he definitely should have a little bit more production. But it's kind of the odd man out, in my opinion. Also brings us to Romeo Okwara, who had a breakout season last year, the young man from Notre Dame. Now, last year, he had 11 sacks. This year, he only has three. 
But he is getting a little bit less snaps thanks to the addition of Wilson and Co. But Okora, he's a nice pass rusher. He mostly plays on nickel downs. Uh, I expect for that to kind of continue. Hopefully he can hold this place, however, as I'd like to see his production pick up a little bit. We'll move to the second level now. We talked about Jamie Collins earlier. We'll talk about Jelani Tavai, who was our NFL tackles leader a season ago. He got moved up to star dev, but he has not played like a star so far this season. He was a three down linebacker to begin the season, but he's actually been demoted off nickel formations. He's gotten his snaps cut, was not doing good at all in the pass category, and his numbers have obviously gone down significantly. He has two sacks, no interceptions, one tackle for a loss, and don't know what July Tavai's future is as well on the team. As he went from a captain, he's still a captain, but not sure if he'll be sticking around for the long term. Also another man, Christian Jones. He has one sack, three tackles. He doesn't play all that often as well. He's been in regression the past couple years. I think he is a free agent after this season, so I don't really expect Christian Jones to be back. And then on the other side, at left outside linebacker, we play, no, that's Jamie Collins. Uh, I meant, oh, I meant Nate Landman. That was the other last linebacker I wanted to touch on. Uh, the rookie who opted out of last year, that's why it says N-A, but he's played pretty good. He's seen his numbers increase significantly the past couple of weeks as he was the one who replaced Jelani in nickel formations, and I think he's done a phenomenal job in that regard. Um, so far this season, he has only played, uh, let's see, I'm looking at the wrong category. He's only played... 70, 87 downs, as you can see, he got his first set of action last week against Minnesota. But he's made improvements. I think he's definitely helped across the middle. And I think he should be a big help to our nickel pass game as we've been getting torn up by tight ends and passes across the middle. So hopefully Nate Lambin can shore that up for us. Lastly, we'll go to the secondary, sort it by interceptions. Jamie Collins has three. Followed by Desmond Trufant, who has two interceptions. And while Desmond Trufant has the most interceptions among secondary pieces, I don't think he's been the best player of the secondary. I'll touch on who I think that is in a minute, but I think Desmond Trufant's shown a little bit of regression this year. Yes, his ratings stack up very nicely, but he's allowed lots of big plays and he's allowed lots of catches. He's also a free agent after this season, so wonder what kind of regression he will hit this upcoming offseason as well as what kind of money he wants. I think right now he's asking for six mil. I might be willing to do it for one year, but I need to see a little bit of a step up in production before I sign him to that one year extension. Other uh, corner we'll talk on, Justin Coleman, who is our highest rated corner. And I don't call his name very often during the season or during games. And that's because he doesn't give up that many catches. So I still think Justin Coleman does a good job. He plays outside. He bounces inside in the slot on three receiver sets. He kind of does it all. and He doesn't really get his name called in that regard. So I think Justin Coleman is filling his spot nicely. He is also a signed for next year as well. And I think he's going to be making around 11, yeah, 11 and a half million dollars. So hopefully we can see that production go for one more year. The last corner I want to touch on is the former number three overall pick from the 2020 draft and that is Jeff Okuda who in my mind has also been the best corner now his stats might not reflect it but Okuda's been basically matched up against a lot of the top receivers that we faced he faced Adam Thielen well he didn't do that great against Adam Thielen but he's faced other receivers across Golden Tate when we played New York he covered Devontae Adams against Green Bay he covered Hollywood Brown I think he's done a very good job. He's yet to record an interception, but he's had a lot of good pass breakups and he's had a lot of tight coverage on the catches he has given up. So I think Okuda has jumped leaps and bounds from his freshman to his sophomore year despite his interceptions being lower. Uh, I think it's okay. Lastly, we'll touch on our safeties who I haven't been overly impressed with. Tracy Walker has played somewhat decent, but he's gotten kind of upset with himself the past couple weeks. His morale is affecting him. And he is a free agent. I am working on a contract with Tracy Walker. I want him to stick around. He's got good coverage skills. But I like to see him actually play a little bit more to his ability. And I don't want his morale affecting him. But I do plan on bringing back Tracy Walker. But then at the free safety spot, it is Anthony Levine. We signed him to a one-year deal. Uh, we weren't really set up well cap-wise this past offseason. So I kind of had to bring in a free safety for cheaper. 
And that was Anthony Levine, and he's not really played that well. Um, he's given up some big plays across the middle on the outside, and I don't think he'll be back after this coming year. Lastly, we'll take a look real quickly at Specialist. Matt Prater's played really good, 16 or 17 on field goals, and he's perfect from extra points. And Jack Fox has done a pretty solid job as well in the punting. Kick return has been Cordell Patterson. He's been okay. Um, I've kind of expected a little bit more of a breakout in the return game, as that's part of the reason also why I signed him is to get some explosive plays in that level. But that's a look at our stats. We'll take a look quickly at what's going on around the league, who leads in most categories, starting off with the quarterbacks. As it looks like Ryan Tannehill is your leader in passing yards at the halfway point, averaging close or he's averaging exactly 5,000 yards on the season. He has 25 so far. Remember, the Titans had the number one overall pick a season ago and they could have drafted Trevor Lawrence, but they did trade the pick for future capital. Very interesting move by the Titans considering Tannehill is 33, but they're showing that they are committed to Tannehill. They did draft Trey Lance, but I think Tannehill is doing a pretty solid job so far. Next up is Matt Ryan, followed by Phil Rivers, Trevor Lawrence, who was leading a while ago, and Pat Mahomes. Your touchdown leader is Pat Mahomes with 21, followed by Tannehill and Ryan with 20. And then interceptions leader is not Matthew Stafford, but it's actually Philip Rivers. He's thrown 14 interceptions. He signed a one-year deal to be the Saints' successor to Drew Brees. You got to wonder... Is this the last go round for Philip Rivers? Let's go to rushing now, where I assume. No, it's actually not Zeke Elliott. Wow, Zeke Elliott does not lead the league in rushing yards. It is Alvin Kamara, the former Saint, the former world champion. He's at 909 yards already on five carries, averaging over 100 a game. Huge pickup by Washington in the offseason as they kind of spent big. They spent on Alvin Kamara and they also spent on Kareem Hunt. So that two-headed monster is trying to lead them to the top of the NFC East. And they do lead it, so it's doing good. The other leader of the NFC East, Ezekiel Elliott, 878 yards, seven touchdowns. As the run game has kind of dominated the NFC East. Then it's Nick Chubb, who we face next. Joe Mixon, Leonard Fournette, Christian McCaffrey. See touchdowns leader, I did see seven. But Gus Edwards has eight, so if on only 57 attempts, Gus Edwards have eight. So it looks like he is getting... A majority of the goal line snaps in Buffalo. Receiving, it is Adam Humphreys who leads the way in receptions as well as yards. So look at Adam Humphreys go. Uh, I, obviously, uh, slot receivers get a lot of attention in Madden, and that's why Adam Humphreys is doing really well. Golden Tate is next, followed by Antonio Brown, who signed with Jacksonville in the offseason. He is proving as to why he is one of the better receivers in the league. Seven touchdowns as well at the halfway point. Uh, don't mind the Cincinnati. I had to create him since I started my franchise late. But uh, he was not in Cincinnati. Your touchdown leader is Justin Jefferson. Has already eclipsed 10 touchdowns on the season. So the only one with double digits. Christian Kirk, Golden Tate, Antonio Brown, Funches, and Samuel round it out. We'll go defensively now. Your leader in tackles is Jamie Collins with 77. Followed by Rokon Smith, Miles Jack. Sack leaders, it looks like anybody with double digit already. Aaron Donald, 15 sacks for Aaron Donald. He is on pace. That's on pace to shatter Michael Stranahan's record. So Aaron, Aaron Donald, basically a cheat code. Uh, we just saw him against our game. He was not fun to play against. Then it's Jabal Shear with seven, so a huge gap between Donald and the rest of the squads. Interceptions, Jalen Mills leads with six, followed by Logan Ryan and Daryl Worley with four, as well as Jalen Smith. So that does it in the stats. We'll also take a look quickly at the yearly awards, because those have been introduced since right at the halfway point. And Ryan Tannehill is actually your MVP leader, followed by Mahomes, Ryan, Rodgers, Lawrence, Prescott, Wilson, Watson, Fields, and Garoppolo. Coach of the year is Sean McDermott, followed by 49ers coach Shanahan and Matt LaFour, so no surprise that the 7-1 squads lead the way. Take a look at the AFC awards. Offensive player is Pat Mahomes, defensive Miles Jack. Offensive rookie Justin Fields, followed by Chubba Hubbard, Sage Surratt, Rashad Bateman, Kyle Pitts, Elijah Mitchell, Xavier Valade, Amon Ross St. Brown, Rakeem Boyd, and CJ Verdell. So a lot of Browns rookies up there who we play next. Charles Snowden leads the way for New York out of former 
Virginia Cavalier. Then you have Brady Breeze, Cameron Bynum, Thomas Graham Jr., Baron Browning, Carlos Basham, Caleb Farley, Jalen Tywin, Dylan Moses, and Christian Albright. Best quarterback is Mahomes. Running back is Mixon. Wide receivers Humphreys, Brown, and Crowder. O-line Schwartz, Trent Williams, Quentin Nelson, David DeCastro, Ronnie Hudson. D-line is Jabal Shear, Clayus Campbell, Joey Bosa. Linebackers to Tavis Brown, followed by Corey Littleton, Demario Davis. DBs, Logan Ryan, CJ Henderson, the second year man out of Jacksonville, showing great progress, followed by Kenny Moore and Eric Berry. Kicker, Lambeau. And the NFC Offensive Player of the Year is Matt Ryan as he leads the way. Deep fence is Aaron Donald, to no surprise. Jamie Collins is second, however. Offensive Rookie of the Year, Trevor Lawrence. That's no surprise what at all, followed by Keontae Ingram, Travis Etienne, Kenneth Gainwell, Amir Smith Marset. Puka Williams Jr., Jamar Chase, Journey Brown, Najee Harris, Rondale Moore. Not surprised, kind of surprised I don't see Tyler Vaughn's up there yet, but a lot of rookies getting work around the NFC. Defensively, it's Hama Nasir Lildeen from Dallas. I kind of questioned that pick in the first round, if you remember the draft episode, so good for him. Followed by the number three overall pick, Patrick Sertain, Asante Samuel, Marvin Wilson is in fourth, Andre Sisco, Deshaun White, Israel Mukuamu. Rashad Ashby, D'Angelo Malone, and Xavier Thomas. Best QB is Matt Ryan. We don't see Matthew Stafford. Running back is Ezekiel Elliott. Wide receivers Golden Tate, Devin Funches, Justin Deverson, Kenny Gade is in seventh. O-line, Zach Martin, David Bakhtiari, Teron Armstead, Jiron Smith, and Jason Kelsey. D-line, of course, Aaron Donald, followed by Nick Bosa, D. Ford, and Kenny Clark. No Lions up there. Linebacker is Jamie Collins, Jalen Smith, Levante David. And then DBs, Jalen Mills, Daryl Worley, Harrison the Hitman Smith, and Mike Hughes. Best kicker is Matt Prater. So that does it for the awards. That'll actually do it for the halfway portion of the season. And we'll do it for this recap. Next episode, we will see, actually we'll be out tomorrow. And we'll be hosting the Cleveland Browns as we try to get moving a little bit through year number two. So hopefully you guys are excited for this one. I hope you guys enjoyed this little mid-season recap. And I hope you enjoy these kind of episodes. They're very easy to make. And I kind of like giving a little bit more in-depth into the season. So I hope you guys are liking that version. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe down below. Especially if you want more franchise content. I'll see you in the next episode. This is Mr. Rob. Y'all have a good weekend.